Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by RBP Chemical Technology, Packaging and Transportation Considerations Plus COVID-19 Global Logistics Fallout. We are going to be discussing the current chemical shipping landscape, the challenges it presents, and how to address those issues. Uh, my name is Eric, and I'll be your moderator. On uh, the agenda for today, we'll begin with a brief introduction to RBP Chemical Technology, some examples of packaging and transportation options, chemical shipping during COVID and how to react. Uh, we know you're probably gonna have some questions along the way. If you do, please post a question in chat and we'll answer it at the end of the presentation. So today we have two presenters, Ernie Latinsky, president of RBP Chemical Technology and Chrissy Blanchard, our international customer support manager. As you can see from their bios, both have extensive experience in the field. I'm gonna hand it over to Ernie first for a brief intro to RBP. Ernie? Hey, thank you, Eric, appreciate it. Hey, for all those out there, we really appreciate your time. And uh, more than that, I just I just want you to know that, that as Eric said, I, I do consider our team subject matter experts on, on, on trade, Trade policy regulations and and what and everything else involved with intra or inter country tra country freight. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of RBP Chemical Technology. I, I'm proud to say that we're a veteran-owned small business with with our with our CEO and principal Mark Cannonberg being a, a Vietnam veteran and uh, with service in the military uh, after after Vietnam as well, being a West Point graduate. Uh, I too, I too have some military service, and and a lot of those values that that we've learned in the military, with with both myself and Mark and others, to include even Diana on this call, um, we 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 try to put in our business. So that's really in our vision and our mission statement to do whatever we can for our partners. The the other piece that I'd like to highlight here is that you know we're ISO 9001 uh, 2015 certified. What what this really means is we do what we say we're gonna do, and then we're just audited by it. And we have the ability to change our processes based on your needs as partners within our, within our, within our ISO program. So we look forward to working with you on, on what we can do to better ourselves and, and to keep, our, keep ourselves to that high standard. The, the last thing here is we're, we're headquartered here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We've been around since 1954. Um, again, the good news is we're privately held the decision makers on this on, on, on this call here are going to help you out. So you've got Chrissy, you know, myself, whatever you need. We have the flexibility and, and nimbleness to do what we need both here in Milwaukee. And then we've got a, you know, some blending out in out in California. We've got an office in Boston. And, uh, we'll, and, and then we've got a little bit in India as well with a full fledged factory made in India for India. Uh, next thing here is the visions. If you take a look at it, we started in 1954 in the graphic arts or printing industry. Uh, we've evolved in electronics and semiconductors, and uh, we, we are also in medical implants. So the odds are if, if, if uh, you've had a stent or potentially a coil or know somebody that's had one in their body, uh, the odds are we've either deoxidized it, uh, electropolished it, or passivated it so that it does what it needs to do for the FDA standards. And then finally, we're in a little bit in the technical toe blending. We're not, we're not the folks to make your windshield wiper fluid. But we look at an approach here, and it's really a learning approach with toe blending. If, if, if somebody's got an idea out there, how do we get it to fruition? How do we get it to market? How do we do so with safety, quality, cost, and on-time delivery, whether, again, domestically or overseas? Finally, the last bullet here, although we're a small company, all right, we do have a global footprint. Uh, we understand uh, what we need to do both domestically and overseas. Example being, Chris is going to talk about some of the certifications we have and, and what we do. But we're like we said, we're in India. We 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 ship to South Korea. Uh, we have warehousing in, in Thailand and then far Asia there as well. And we ship to South America and China on a daily basis. So we we on any given day we'll ship to you know one of 66, 67 countries around the world where we have our installed base and our partners. So that's a little about RBP technology. If we could go to the next slide, please. I'm going to pass it over to Chrissy, and, and she's going to give you an overview. And again, I consider Chrissy a subject matter expert. Consider her your trusted agent as well for, for everything we're going to talk about here. And, and please feel free to reach out. Chrissy, I appreciate all you do. I'm going to hand it over to you at this point. 
Wonderful. Well, great uh, background and introduction to RBP, Ernie. Thank you for that. I'm going to dive right in and go into RBP packaging. As Ernie mentioned, we serve a few different industries and the different industries do have different packaging considerations. So I'm just going to review some of those for your situational awareness. First, on the print side, primarily, um, we offer products in quartz. And our quartz are typically packaged 12 to a case, as you can see in the photo. The next size up is our four liter or one gallon bottle. The photo here is of the four liter bottle, but the one gallon bottle is approximately that size. And they are both packaged four bottles per case. The next size up is our five gallon or 20 liter pail. The poly pails happen to be the exact same pail for both these, um, these volumes. They're just filled accordingly. And then to the far right is a photo of our steel pail, which would contain a product that would be um, flammable for an example. The next size up is a 20 gallon carboy. Again, this is a pack size you might see primarily um, on the print industry. Uh, we, we have customers that will send super concentrates down to like South America and save on transportation with that. Um, similarly, the 55 gallon drum or 20 liter drum, it's just a bigger version, or I should say the carboy is a smaller version of the drum. The drum is a more um, common pack size. And here, photoed is the poly drum and it is the exact same drum used for both 200 liters or 55 gallons and again that would be available in a steel drum if the product is flammable as well and lastly we have a photo of our tote and this one is a 330 gallon cage tote for the larger volumes uh, of chemistry and mo more importantly I'd like to point out that customer specific packaging is available um, may be available upon request. So feel free to reach out if you've got specific packaging that you're interested in. And all of our packaging is UN certified, meaning it's designed and approved to safely contain dangerous goods under normal conditions of transportation. Wanted to point out on this next slide here, very important for logistics purposes, is try to maximize your pallets. If you're not just ordering one carton or two carton of a product, um, you're going to want to put as much freight on a pallet as possible to get the most bang for your buck for transportation costs. So as you see here, we've got four drums strapped to the pallet that would maximize a pallet. We could get six carboys onto a pallet. 36 pails would fulfill or 36 cases. Uh, and that includes uh, gallons and of course, if you want to uh, mix it up as well, you can do that. So now we're going to talk a little bit about transportation. RBP frequently and confidently ships hazardous and non-hazardous chemistry to over 30 countries worldwide via ground, ocean, and air. Our logistics experts, Alan Peschel and myself, were certified in HAZCOM, which is hazardous communication training, DOT, the Department of Transportation. This is for US ground transportation. IMDG, which is the International Marine Time Dangerous Goods. And this is for sending hazmat or dangerous goods via air transportation, or excuse me, ocean transportation. And then IATA, which stands for International Air Transportation Association. Um, this certification gives us the credentials for understanding and shipping hazmat via air transportation. So ground transportation is always going to be your best route. Um, and, but to know what you're looking for as far as hazmat, how can this go? You're gonna to want to look at section 14 of an SDS. This section displays the transportation information that you will specifically need to know for sending ground, air, or ocean. Um, and for air shipments, um, the three digit packing instruction number on the far right of that IATA line um, is going to indicates um, where we look in our IATA dangerous goods book for regulations. Um, and if you are considering sending product by air, of course, you're going to want to send the smallest volume, but definitely look at the SDS. Some products will say not restricted at all. And then you, you have a lot more options. Other products such as this 
snapshot that you see in the screen here will have the UN hazmat information. And then some products may even say forbidden for air transportation. And this would be the case for a product such as an oxidizer that might require a vented cap. This next slide is a simple at a glance look at options when transporting, uh, transporting chemistry, excuse me. Non-hazardous has the least restrictions. And then you can see hazardous, you're gonna have some restrictions and then even more so if the product has a vented cap. Again, we would refer to the DOT, IATA or IMDG regulations that I spoke about earlier um, to show us the volume restrictions or segregation regulations for sending hazardous material. Um, and of course, if you don't have those people at your facility, you can definitely call RBP. You can ask for myself or Alan Peschel. He's our shipping and receiving supervisor. Um, we will definitely assist in figuring out the best way to send our chemistry your way. So in general, how do we decide the best way to ship? Domestically, ground is always going to be your best choice. When sending ground, we can send smaller volumes through a courier such as UPS ground or FedEx ground. Um, and then for larger, sometimes even more restricted chemicals, we send by trucks and carriers. You may find that restricted chemicals in smaller volumes cannot go through UPS or FedEx. And in that case, we still have to send it via courier on a pallet. Um, and again, if it must go air for whatever reason, your best bet is always to keep the volume small. The cost and risk associated with sending dangerous goods by air is a lot to consider. Then internationally, you can consider air, ocean, and ground. So ocean, it's going to be a slower method, but it's going to be less costly. And this is going to be your route for greater volumes if you're sending pallet or pallet loads, um, even a full container load. Air would be faster, but it's going to come at a much higher cost. Um, and it's also best for smaller volume. So even if you have a smaller volume and you can wait the longer time, it's probably going to be more economical to still send that small volume via air versus uh, ocean. And lastly, ground can be considered, uh, but that would be primarily for countries that we share our borders with here in America, such as Canada and Mexico. Then we can send goods um, via a truck. Now that I've shown you the packaging and things to consider while shipping hazardous and non-hazardous chemistry, I want to pivot to the current global crisis that we're facing since COVID, and that is the container shortage and severe port congestions. So what's happening? An unforeseen cascade of events caused by the pandemic has us facing a worldwide container shortage crisis. It's called a crisis because these lack of containers has a ripple down effect through our entire supply chains, disrupting trade on a global scale right down to domestic transportation. Basically, it's a supply and demand issue with these containers. There's just not enough out of them, of them out there for all the transportation that's happening coming into America. And as a result, there's delays and escalated freight costs, which are felt both on imports and exports. And this is ground, ocean, and air. How did we get here? Well, first of all, America's comparatively slow handling of containers has long been a source of supply chain pain, and it's a leading cause of empty container shortages in Asia, but never seen to the extent that we're seeing today. Western laborers, we don't work 24-7 around the clock like they do in Asia, so we have slower handling. Plus, they've created larger container ships, which is good for bringing in more goods at a time, but these larger container ships are taking longer to unload. Then COVID, the coronavirus wreaked havoc on the, the global supply chains last year. So thinking back, we had lockdowns, these temporary, temporarily closed factories, and it disrupted the normal flow of trade. Economic activity slowed dramatically at the start of the pandemic. And then there was this rapid rebound in trade volumes that followed, and that caught companies off guard. So on top of that, then you've got port workers who fraction are out with COVID, another fraction are out with contact tracing, traffic is piling on at the ports. We had seen at one point over 30 to 35 ships per day waiting to berth. They just can't dump their cargo fast enough. 
today we're down to about 16 the last i heard so we're moving in the right direction it's just really slow this trade and balance is just slow pain to get through then we have a trade boom to consider or the import boom you could call it um, during the pandemic, you found more people working from home um, and doing so. This caused an uptick in online purchases. So you're talking ordering office equipment or at-home exercise equipment, um, electronics. These things primarily are not made in the USA. So we started importing a lot more than what we were exporting. <clears throat> and then I know Ernie wanted to talk briefly on uh, subject of the the 2021 Gulf storm that really had um, an effect on our chemical um, manufacturers here in America. Ernie? Yeah. Hey, Chrissy, I appreciate it. Hey, just to let every, everybody know a little, I, I don't know if you remember, but February 12th through the 16th, we had a, you know, the once in a lifetime storm down in the Gulf, Gulf Coast. So everything from Texas all the way through central Louisiana with snow and freezing. The implications of that was Many of the facilities down where we're about 90% of chemicals are really produced in the United States based on, you know, hydrocarbons being in, in, in the Gulf there and then hydrocarbons being produced in the chemicals. Uh, many of the facilities went into a, a, a horrible situation where they were not online. So some of those facilities, you know, were, were months removed from it here, three months, but some of those facilities are still not running. Products are in allocation. We've seen force majeure. And, and really the impact is, you're seeing it across everything you do with all commodities. So everything from chlorine, where you can't get pool or, or you can't get some chlorine this summer for pools, whether municipal or your personal pool, you know, to to the cost of lumber. You know, with the housing boom, uh, lumber is needed and chemicals are used to, to treat lumber, right, and drywall for that matter. So we're seeing a lot of this. The, the good news is a lot of these plants are coming back online, but still, this is this is where we're at. So some of the some of the chemicals we tried to get from overseas. All right. It further exasperated this issue. And those 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 vessels are, like Chrissy said, floating around on the East Coast and the West Coast of the U.S. So there is there is an imbalance in the chemical industry as well. And uh, we're all working our way through it. But I think it impacts everybody as a you know private citizen or whatever corporation you work for or, or what company you may work for. So, Chrissy, I'm going to hand it back to you. But, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was it was pretty bad. And, and, and I think the U.S. is working through that piece as well. Yeah, definitely. So we, we've, we've got that chemical situation happening, which affects us directly as a chemical manufacturer. So with this whole container crisis, this was further triggered by we have supply chain wrinkles, um, like the US trade war with China, um, more demand pulses during the uh, pandemic, you know, economies around the world were opening at various speeds, opening at different times. Um, even locking back down, which we've seen recently in the cases of Europe and India. So all these different things cause wrinkle in the entire imbalance that we're seeing. And then lastly, let's not forget about that uh, Suez Canal traffic jam that we've seen back in March that had uh, a, a further impact on the mess that was already being seen. Basically demand like we've never seen before. Um, it's, it's a mess, right? <laughs> So COVID-19 global trade uh, fallout. So these severe equipment imbalances are challenging the global container shipping industry worldwide. Shippers are researching or searching for containers and this is driving up costs. Rates are at record highs, things that we've never seen, but some countries are seeing rates increase up to tenfold. They're calling it explosion in rates. I, I still see it today, it's, it's outrageous. Over the course of 2021, ocean carriers will continue to operate at this high capacity um, and they're gonna remain high and they're gonna keep surging. Um, some experts are predicting things may begin to improve soon, um, perhaps starting to see relief this fall, but just as quick as you say that, we, we know that we're gonna turn into the busy season with the, um, the holidays around the, the, around the corner. So some experts are saying that we're gonna see this remain through 2022. Um, it is short term, but it's a long term short term, if that makes any sense. And all this is going to sort of begin to define a new normal later in life. And we just have to, we have to wait and see. Um, things are constantly changing. We'll just get through it. I'm now going to talk a little bit about how this is affecting air freight. So I just 
briefed you on the global container shortage crisis. Okay, how is that? Why is that affecting air freight? So more than 80% of global trade by volume is moved by sea. And right now with the container shortages, this is causing all these port delays, port congestion. This is six to eight weeks of delays that some of these ports are seeing mostly on the West Coast. Um, but it's still, we're still feeling it on the East Coast. Um, this is this expensive and unreliable ocean freight is pushing shippers to move cargo by air. Air cargo was up over 53% just in April and it's gone up again in May and I'm already seeing and I'm doing quotes right now, June is not looking any prettier. So this additional volume, um, while international passenger flights are down, so you think a lot of air cargo does move in the belly of passenger flights. And if those international flights are not moving from country to country, that's less space for this cargo to go. So we've got that. And then the cargo flights that are strictly for cargo are definitely at capacity. And this is driving these air freight prices up. On top of that, we've got rising fuel, which you've probably already seen or been feeling. Um, those costs are adding pressure to pricing prices. So it's all very volatile right now. And then it's, well, why is this affecting ground freight? Um, there was already a driver shortage. Um, it's here domestically United States. And that started back in about 2018. But now even more than ever, there's been a reduction in commercial driving, driver training and licensing due to the pandemic. People just weren't out there training for these jobs. So we've already got a driver shortage. Um, we've got the additional unemployment assistance that's sort of keeping people out of the working um, field of truck drivers. Um, stimulus dollars stimulated consumption, and that thus increases freight volume. So the activity just remains high, and um, that high activity puts pressure on prices. Um, and then the container shortage that I mentioned earlier um, when these containers are coming into our ports along the East Coast, West Coast, they're being forced to transload them into trucks. They're not letting those containers move inland into United States to other ports. Um, so that's taking up a huge supply of our trucks. So in short, again, the entire supply, supply chain is just inundated with cargo. Um, so these are... Um, just forcing unanticipated and escalating costs, this increase in demand with reduced capacity. What do you get? You get rate increases. So overall, just be aware of what's going on. You know, this domestic ground transportation that I mentioned um, here in America is, is, is not foreign to other countries. They see that same situation happening in Europe. So be aware of the impacts in your particular country and consider other factors such as um, India, we have a plant, as Ernie said, we have manufacturing in India. We have a lot of um, customers and partners in India, and they recently just had a cyclone on the West Coast. They're just coming back from lockdowns. So all this has an effect on their supply chains. So what is RBP doing? I'm going to turn this over to Ernie briefly to touch on this. Yeah. Hey, Chrissy, I appreciate it. So this is, this is the piece where I hope we can help folks out. So you know, whether you purchase chemistry from us or not, I, I want you to, uh, to to partner with us eventually and be our trusted agent. So that's the way we look at this. And, and that's how we've handled these challenges. So as Chrissy said, we've had external factors, but we've been able to mitigate a lot of it and, and put risk aside uh, based on the way we do business. The, the first bullet and the second bullet and the third bullet are really linked together. Uh, we've got some we've got some great things we've done and we've hedged over time on freight. And we did that via longstanding trust relationships with our supply chain. So that's everything on transit and then what we do on chemistry as well. And really it's that open communications, right? And, and continuous monitoring with our partners, you know, in bullet one that, that we've done. And then we maintain transparency. So we've got contracts in, in place and it's really, uh, you take a look at bullet number four here, it's that leveraging pre-existing contracts we have. So it's, it's, it was done openly. Right? It was done transparently and it was done with trust based on decades of relationships with some of the carriers we have, some of the freight forwarders, freight forwarders we have, and then obviously a supply 
supply chain, you know, with, with consumable goods, the raw, raw materials we receive and, and convert into intellectual property and, and solutions for you. So that's what we've done. The other thing we're doing here, and this is the, this is the piece where I, I really state that you really need to talk to Chrissy if you get a chance or to Alan, if you've got some ideas and, and you want to eliminate non-value activities such as processing, you know, movement and wait times. And, and that's what we do. And that's the way we're doing it. We, we're, we're able to remove those non-value activities, as I mentioned here, which are all costly. And at the end of the day, it's, you, you don't want to pay for freight. You don't want to pay for storage time. You don't want to pay for a container sitting somewhere and paying excess fees. So that's what we've done. And it really goes back to, you know, the, the trust and integrity that we have here in the first three bullets. And then, you know, a little for, foresight in, in putting some contracts in place going back a few years here. In, in hedging and seeing this, we can't stop. We can't stop fuel surcharges, but we can stop a lot of other things. As as fuel surcharges, both internationally and domestically, are, are really governed by a, a a index weekly. But again, this goes back to what we do, and we want to earn your trust as well, just like as, as we've done with you know upstream and downstream with other supply chain partners. Chrissy, I'm going to hand it back off to you. But before I do that, again, I, I everybody out there um, in 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 any questions that you may have or, or any ways to try to leverage what we have, all right, and try to leverage some of the efficiencies that, that we can help you with, please contact Chrissy, who, who is a subject matter expert on this and does this every day, all day. So Chrissy, back to you. You betcha. Thanks, Ernie. Yes, definitely give us a call and we'll see how we can help you. So the next slide is going to be just that, um, some tips, how to react, how should you react to this, this, this logistics crisis? Uh, basically, number one, this is reality. Plan ahead, order in advance. This isn't going away. We can't make it go away. Like Ernie said, there's some things that we can leverage, but you know, we can't make fuel surcharges go away. I certainly can't get out there and push those containers off ships and I certainly can't make them move any faster <laughs> across the Trans-Pacific, but um, it's reality. Be aware of it, plan ahead, order in advance. Definitely, probably not the best time to have just-in-time uh, inventory situations going on. Consider ordering larger but fewer shipments. This might help minimize the pain of your transportation costs. Um, if you're international, consider an air transportation shipment in combination with a very well-planned ocean shipment. This can kind of help leverage, okay, it's going to take a little bit longer to get here. So I'll have maybe a couple pallets coming via ocean, but then I'll have a couple cartons coming through air to hold me off a little bit longer. Compare a few quotes and modes um, just to make sure you're getting the best cost and the most efficient service possible. This is one of the areas that I um, take a lot of pride in at RBP is our relationships and our rates with our freight forwarders. Um, I shop around for my customers and the savings that we, we get, I pass on to you. And so um, if you don't have good relationships with freight forwarders, do do trust in RBP that we do, and we can get the material to you for some very competitive rates with forwarders that have really great customer service. And so that's very important during these difficult times, getting anything sent, import or export is that customer service. Sometimes it's not even about the dollar amount, it's about the service, the communication, and just getting your goods. Um, and then lastly, Buffer your freight, your freight budgets and transit times to consider these changes. Um, costs due to these unforeseen delays um, in limited capacity are going to rise, so just be prepared. And again, let us help you create a plan. Um, if you have a year-long demand projected, you know, talk to us. Maybe we can help you find the best way to avoid any. Um, you know, late shipments or whatever, um, if we can kind of see what you're looking at and how we can get product to you um, the most economical and reasonable way possible. Yeah. Hey, Chris, this is Ernie. Can I add one point here? Sure. Yeah. When, when we start talking, creating a plan and, and that bullet too, there, there's probably going to be a lot of folks that grimace on ordering extra, which takes away from cash flow. But if we could help you, you know, with Chrissy specifically, figuring out extra volume, which may be cash flow on the balance sheet, you know, ordering an asset. There's a lot of direct and indirect costs that, that could help offset on the income statement. And, and 
we'll help you formulate that anytime you want, you know, to take it to whoever it may be in your organization to see the true value or gains that you're getting. So we're proud of that and, and we will help you with that. So Chrissy, back to you. I just wanted to state that, you know, we're there to look, look at the income and a balance sheet for others as well, you know, from a micro perspective with such orders. Yes. Yes. We definitely can help out in that way. So that basically um, wraps up the presentation. I hope everybody who is tuned in, whether you're here in the United States or from um, abroad, I hope you've learned something. Um, again, like Eric had mentioned, please do use the chat box question or such function for questions. Um, and as always, if we can't answer your question live, um, we'll definitely jot it down. We'll follow up with you later um, and get you in the right direction. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chrissy and Ernie. That was really awesome. Uh, so yes, uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, so uh, here we go. Actually, Chloe sent us a question. She asked, how far in advance should we plan on ordering chemicals? I guess that's related to the current, um, the current, current landscape here with a uh, chemicals being stopped and uh, stopped in shipping. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I know who Chloe is. Hi, Chloe. Um, I think that's very, um, it's, it's going to be customized based on your product and your location. Um, there's not going to be a one size fits all answer on that. So it's good that you're thinking about, you know, how much sooner should I be ordering versus what I'm used to as far as lead times. Um, so maybe offline, Chloe, if you want to reach out to me, you have my email address um, and let's look at what's, what products are of concern and, um, you know, build a plan to get the material um, to you in a safe, safe distance of time and um, logistics wise. Yeah. Hey, Chrissy, this is Ernie. You know, fortunately, we don't have back orders based on raw material shortages or, or to, to make finished goods for situations like this, but I, I would emphasize as well. Hey, figure out what date you need it there and let us work back backwards, you know, from the delivery date that it needs to be there on a dock. And Chrissy's very good at that. And we'll use some of our Lean Six Sigma, you know, folks here to help out with that piece as well. So I appreciate that question. And it comes up often enough, right, with with, with supply chain shortages, you know, right now, as well as the freight environment. But again, let us work with you. You tell us, voice of the customer, when you need it there. Let us figure it out with you. From a timing perspective and you know lead time perspective, I should say, and then from a uh, cost perspective. So appreciate, great question. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so another question: Are air shipments limited to smaller volumes? I will take that one. So this is sort of a yes and no answer. With dangerous goods, yes, you're going to find limitations that um, are regulated by IATA. Um, and that's dependent on the packing instruction number that I mentioned earlier found on the SDS. Um, in many cases with our hazardous chemicals, if you typically purchase a four liter bottle, it can only be packaged two liters full within that four liter bottle. So if you want to order four liters, we'd actually be sending two by two liter bottles. Um, again, this is out of our control, but it's just, it's, just the way that dyada regulations have set forth the rules for certain hazmat. Some has has this product, you can still send standard packaging. Again, it's every product's different. Um, but when I say yes and no, so yes for hazmat, but no for non-hazardous. If your product is non-hazardous, you can send a whole pallet of goods on a plane if you're willing to pay the premium for the space. So it's it, with chemistry, you have to put into consideration whether it's hazardous or non-hazardous. Okay. Good to know. Um, if someone was willing to wait for the longer ocean transportation, can you send a small shipment by sea, such as just a carton? Okay, well, yes. Um, however, you're gonna find that air freight may even be cheaper to send, uh, send a small package via ocean. At least it was in cases prior to the current market, but you're going to have to consider the increased risk of your shipment being damaged. Um, there's a lot of handling that happens, a lot of rigorous movement while the containers are at sea. Um, so you have to consider what your small carton is going to sustain. Um, plus, you know, being on a big, big, scary container with all these large shipments, you have to consider you're going to be 
paying extra for packaging, such as creating. Um, again, that's going to be higher costs. As Ernie mentioned, lumber prices are really high right now. So you're building a crate for a small carton, again, a lot of pros and cons you're going you're gonna to be weighing out. And um, it's a business decision that your company would just have to make. And in rare cases, though, some of our chemistry, if it has a vented cap, this may be your only option. So if you're looking to send any sort of volume overseas of a product that is an oxidizer or that requires that vented cap, you're going to have to uh, deal with sending it by sea. Hey, Chrissy, uh, if I could add, I, I need to give you credit here. <laughs> I, I think we do have another option in, in some cases, Chrissy. And, and for all those out there, if, if, if you have a little extra time, we could do that. We could make it economical. If, if, if we have a full container and it may be going to a similar location, and if we could, if there's extra room on that container, you know, we're already paying for a full container potentially for another customer. We could prorate that, you know, and Chris, I know you're very good at doing things like that and thinking out of the box. So I got to give you credit for that one. If someone's oh, yeah. willing Absolutely. to, you know, Absolutely. piggyback a shipment on, you know, which you do all the time and, yeah. you know, more about containers than I ever will or, or a lot of people. So I, I got to give you credit on that one as another economical option. If folks have a little extra time and we could work all that out like you always do. So. Yes. Perfect. All right. All right. So I just have one more question here. And thank you, everybody who submitted a question to us today. Uh, I've seen different pallets and drums used over time. We've seen plastic pallets as well as other heat treated specialized pallets. We've also seen different drum tops at times on products. Can you provide any insight as to why such variations exist in pallets and drum packaging? Yeah. So domestically a pallet is a pallet is a pallet and we can send our pallets any pallet anywhere but when you're sending goods internationally you need to have what's called heat treated wood or plastic pallets but most most cases um, it's called a heat treat wood process um, and this is for the pallets your crates um, boxes anything that you're building even the dunnage that you use to brace your within a container all that has to be of heat treated wood. And the reason for that is because wood packaging material that is made of unprocessed raw wood is considered a pathway for spreading pests and invasive species into foreign countries. So to limit the entry and spread of such bad guys, pests um, through international trade, there's regulations that are used and it has to be, it's called ISPM 15. And that's where um, they're stamped and it's ensured that that wood that was used for that pallet is heated to a core temperature of like 140 degrees for a minimum of 30 minutes. And this is going to ensure that all insects and their larva is going to be killed off. And now that pallet can be used to ship goods internationally. And like I mentioned, there's also plastic pallets. These come in at a little bit of a higher cost, but some countries um, absolutely do not want to get involved with the um, heat treated wood at all. And they do require the plastic pallets. So that's also an option. And then I believe the other half of the question was about strum caps. And yes. the, the differences are, um, there's a different kind of cap for when, um, again, talking about vented caps, when something, when a product needs to breathe, for uh, while it's being stored and transported, transported, um, it's got to have a, a the the vented cap. So that's probably the difference in caps that you're seeing on those drums. Yeah. Hey, Chrissy, I, this is Ernie. I'm going to add on. The, you, you'll see plastic pallets or, or high density polyethylene for other reasons as well with safety. When you start talking corrosives or oxidizers, in the case of oxidizers, I think they're plastic pallets because you don't want it to be near an organic, which is wood. You know, to, to maybe start some of those regulations exist. And uh, Chris, you have too much time that you know how long a pallet needs to be heat treated and what temperature. So. <laughs> I remember it was a it was a test question on my uh, when I got my my certified global business professional certificate. It was a test question. I was prepared for it. <laughs> All right, congrats on that one. So, no, I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ernie and Chrissy. This was awesome. Very, very, very informative. Uh, if you want to learn more or you have some questions, uh, Chrissy's contact information is on the screen right now, but you can also learn more at rbpchemical.com. Um, we'll send out a recap of this meeting and uh, keep your eyes open for our next webinar.
Thank you again for attending and you have yourself a great day. Yep. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.